Jackson, who speak on antimatter-based interstellar propulsion. Uh, Dr. Gerald Jackson received his doctorate in the field of accelerator physics from Cornell University. From 1985 until 2000, he was instrumental in improving the performance of the Fermilab proton antiproton collider program. Dr. Jackson was a leader in the design, construction, and commissioning of the innovative two mile circumference antiproton uh, recycler ring, the last major particle physics accelerator built in the United States. Designed to increase Fermilab performance by 2.5 times, the recycler and other upgrades actually increased it more than a factor of five. Since 2000, Dr. Jackson has founded several companies, one working on antimatter propulsion problems for NASA and culminating in a 2016 crowdfunded study of antimatter production enhancements. Dr. Jackson. Good morning. So today I'm going to be talking to you about antimatter-based interstellar propulsion. And so the uh, idea is to use antimatter as a spark plug, not as a fuel, okay? So the idea is to minimize the amount of antimatter since that really is the difficult part of this task is uh, producing enough antimatter to actually get a spacecraft of considerable mass up to uh, a fraction of the speed of light. So in uh, two years ago at uh, TVIW, I spoke about this design, and basically you have some thermal antiprotons that are wafting up onto a sail. The sail is composed, uh, it's a thin sail, it's really a plate, a curved plate of depleted uranium. And so what happens is when an antiproton comes in contact with uranium, it 100% of the time induces fission. And so what happens since I'm on the, the fission event occurs right at the back edge, at least one of the fission daughters, well, the fission daughters on average are back to back. So on average, one goes into the sail and parts its momentum. The other one goes off into space as reaction mass. And so it ends up, you get a momentum transfer and uh, the sail uh, accelerates. And this, so this is a little like the Wiley Coyote on a, on a cart with a sail with his own fan and he's pushing his, uh, but it, it's, a, it's sound physics principles. Okay, so the problems with this was that uh, there was no focusing and so the fission daughters would go off in every direction. So you have to account for the geometric degradation of the thrust from that. You uh, also have uh, one, only one fission daughter emitted per fission on average. And then because you're dealing with this plate, uh, there's a limited dry mass to fuel mass ratio. So, and at the time we had not yet uh, come up with a good way of storing antimatter long-term. So the idea is that we're thinking about how do you decelerate once you're in the uh, destination solar system and the antimatter has to last that transit time, so 50 years, whatever. So even when you're down near, I mean, most people, when they think of producing antimatter, uh, and uh, when you're talking about grams of it, you're talking about um, uh, antihydrogen, molecular antihydrogen, okay? And so at that point, you can get a uh, solid antihydrogen, so you can store that at below 10 degree Kelvin. The problem is, even if you're down in the millikelvin range, there's enough of a, um, of a, a sublimation rate that uh, you will lose it by the time you get to your destination um, solar system. So we had to figure out how to deal with that. So uh, around two, 2019, uh, early this year, uh, we came up with a different architecture so one of the things that was interesting that it's very hard to find in the literature, in the physics literature, is it turns out that these fission, so now imagine that I have uh, a uranium, depleted uranium beam, so it's singly ionized uranium uh, ions, and I, in an electrostatic trap, so they're bouncing back and forth and they're being focused, and this is completely stable um, uh, storage um, system. 
And now I inject an antiproton that's traveling in the same direction. What happens is that it, this is very similar to what's called electron cooling in accelerator physics. The two beams will eventually go at the same velocity, and at that point, the antiproton gets basically displaces an electron because it has the same charge as the electron, and then cascades down to the ground state and overlaps with the nucleus, and you get an annihilation event. So there's no cross sections in this. 100% of the antiprotons that you inject into this trap will cause an annihilation. Now, because I'm in this electrostatic trap, the two fission daughters come up, both leave the trap. Okay, now, it turns out that, and this is what's hard to find in the literature, those fission daughters tend to have a charge of about 20. So when the uranium uh, loses, when fissions, the two daughters leave behind about 40 of the electrons out of the 92 electrons, okay, just because the acceleration is so extreme. So what you do now is uh, instead of in the past you've seen all these uh, drawings of magnetic nozzles. In this case, you can just use electrostatics. So you have an inner and outer uh, wire mesh, and you put a, a voltage bias across it, and now you and you you create a parabolic um, uh, geometry or electric field configuration. You put your trap right here at the apex of the inner uh, uh, electrode, and now you can focus all your uh, fission daughters. So now you get much higher thrust per fission. Uh, because you can now inject um, arbitrarily a, uh, a number of uh, uranium, you don't have this uh, uh, restriction on the dry mass to fuel mass ratio. So you can get much further out on the rocket equation in terms of mass ratio. And uh, now both fission daughters are coming out. So when you add all that together, this is a much more efficient design. So, and then what we also did, and what I'll be talking about in a few minutes, is how do you store long-term the antimatter? So this talk is uh, about propulsion and power architecture. So the idea is to decelerate, uh, orbit, insert into orbit around the exoplanet, and perform decades-long scientific study. One of the interesting things about this is you now have enough time, once you figure out <clears throat> what uh, you've discovered and you send the information back to Earth, you have the capability of now receiving updated instructions from Earth and basically reprogramming your probe. So it's just like the uh, uh, New Horizons where it was reprogrammed to go past Ultimate Thule or uh, you know the Curiosity rover where you could tell it where to go. But instead of a 45 minute delay, you're talking about a four year delay or each way. Um, in this talk, in, in what we've come up with, there are no magic wands. So this is all experimentally uh, verified physics. Uh, we don't invoke fusion that hasn't happened yet. Uh, break even fusion, okay, sorry. Uh, so we're, we're trying to keep this grounded. Uh, now, the team uh, has over a century of experience building scientific instruments. So for instance, I'm an accelerator physicist. So my whole career, I have been subservient to the particle physicists. They're the ones who dictate the physics or the destination, and then I build the scientific instruments so they can do their work, okay? In the same way, a rocket scientist, <clears throat> at least in today's world, is subservient to the planetary scientists, okay? Or the, the solar physicists, okay? Um, so the, they're the ones who set the goals and we're, we tell them what, how to do it, and, you know, what technology they need, what investments they need, and set down a technology path, uh, development path. Okay, so uh, the technical part of this talk is gonna be mostly about antimatter availability and storage. Um, i point out the progress uh, in this is completely funding limited, basically my wallet. Uh, it's been very hard to get funding for this. So, uh, antiproton production. So, it turns out the positrons are relatively easy to produce. It's the uh, antiprotons that are the difficult part. 
So if you look from the history of the production of antiprotons, in the early days, there was a 10 to the ninth increase in 20 years. And what we basically have to do is now get back on this. This was the Fermilab era, and now we're out here in 2020. Uh, what the proposal is to get back on this curve. Okay, now, a lot of the, this inflection point here where the curve stopped was basically because the field of accelerator physics is determined by, again, what the particle physicists need. The particle physicists didn't need any more antiprotons, so every, everything stopped. Okay, that, it's literally, uh, I think yesterday there was this discussion about um, uh, utilization of um, resources in the solar system and how they're limited. You remember that um, back before World War I, if you looked at any of the geography books, aluminum was listed as a trace element. Okay, it wasn't until we needed aluminum that we found aluminum. Okay, and so the same, way, the same case is once we've shown that we have a demand for the, the antiprotons, there are ways to get back on this curve and to get up to rates of 20 grams per year. Okay. Now, how much do you really need for a mission? So it really depends on how fast you want to get there. And it's a very sharp curve. So this is 56 years transit time, 97 years, 150 years, 200 years. 0.1c uh, or so, 10% of the speed of light, 5%, 3%, 2.25%. 10 year uh, deceleration burn, uh, always assuming 10 kilogram dry mass. Now it turns out that if you just plug in the rocket equation, your fuel mass to drive mass is, is a strong function of the speed. And so it turns out that the amount of antimatter you need is basically goes as the square as the transit time. So you're talking for a 50-year uh, mission, you're talking about 590 grams. For a 150-year mission, you're down by over an order of magnitude. Okay, so by just allowing yourself to wait a factor of three, you reduce the amount of fuel you need by factor 10. And this is just an outcome of the uh, rocket equation. So now, on a, uh, if you look at history, there have been plenty of projects that have taken over 100 years that uh, mankind has embarked on. So for instance, here's York Minster Cathedral, 252 years to complete. Okay, now why, why did people do this? It was a religious uh, motivation, but nonetheless, it was strong enough to uh, provide a consistent motivation throughout those centuries. In our case, I don't think our society has that sort of fervor for anything for two years, let alone 250 years. So we probably have to find something to do um, along the way. But before we talk about that, let's talk about the cost of making antiprotons. I have seen the most ridiculous estimates for how much it would cost and how long it would take to produce antimatter. The worst thing you could do is take Fermilab or CERN history or experience and then just scale that up because they were never trying to make a fuel. They were trying to make a beam for a collider which required very, very, what's called uh, longitud very small longitudinal emittance. So they needed a, uh, a time, a bunch length, and an energy spread that was very, very small. That is a criterion that has nothing to do with fuel production. You remove that, that right away takes out a factor of 10 to the sixth in uh, the, the production rate. So if you go through from basic principles and you you say, okay, I'm not going to use a fixed target to produce the antiprotons. I'm going to use a colliding beam infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to assume a, a production rate of 20 grams per year. Uh, the price of electricity, uh, it turns out that if you had a 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer solar array, you could power this entire facility. Okay, and so I'm not assuming a grid and all the maintenance of the grid and everything. So uh, uh, one cent per kilowatt hour is, uh, is reasonable. 
So the efficiency, it takes basically 66, pro in this situation, it takes 66 protons accelerated to 1.9 GeV per antiproton. Okay, and then you can go through all the numbers, and it turns out you need an average proton beam power of 7.6 gigawatts, which means you need uh, $670 million a year in the operating cost. This is six orders of magnitude smaller than other estimates I've seen in the past based on simple extrapolation of what was happening at CERN and at Fermilab. So this is, that is not an unreasonable at all. These are other mission costs. Uh, you know, you have New Horizons. Just adding Ultima Thule was $82 million. You know, Cassini, $3.6 billion. Apollo itself was $25 billion. So it's, uh, it's now not trillion. I mean, in the past, they, I was seeing millions of trillions of dollars. It's nowhere near that. And now it's a, it's a significant amount of money, but it's not unreasonable. It's within kind of reason. It's just a, do we really want to do it or not. So what could you do along the way? So it turns out there's lots of kind of interesting things along the way. You have the interstellar medium. You can measure the, um, ma the interstellar medium's magnetic field the, the uh, cloud um, charge particle density, the neutral particle density. You could do flybys of Kuiper Belt objects and flyby of Oort cloud objects. When I was researching this talk, I was amazed at how little information there is about the Oort cloud. Basically, the only information we have is extrapolating uh, information from orbits of comets that are coming in. Okay, and so I, I did a considerable amount of uh, research into what would you do? Uh, to try and do some physics along the way, and how soon could you do it? So uh, I took a worst-case scenario and said, okay, let's say we're, we're going to accelerate with the onboard fuel, so we're going to use the rocket equation. So 10% of the speed of light is in 10 years acceleration. So your acceleration rate is very low in the beginning because you still have all that fuel on board. And by the time you get rid of all your acceleration fuel, you're now at your maximum acceleration rate. So if you go through this, this um, put this data together, you end up with this curve, which is the uh, distance out as a function of mission duration. So it says that it, by, within five years, you get to the inner edge of the Oort cloud, okay? So in, within a couple of years, you get to the gravity lens point you pass Pioneer in the first year. Uh, you know, you're at the outside edge of the Kuiper belt in three years. So what could you do with this? And so for this, I concentrated on the Oort cloud, but you could do the same thing, the sort of, same sort of analysis with uh, these other destinations. So one thing you could do, it, it turns out that the estimate, the best estimate for Oort cloud objects of a particular interesting size is about 0.1 AU average distance between them. So if you're traveling at 10% of the speed of light, that means you're going at AU every 5,000 seconds. So every two hours, roughly. Or, yeah, roughly two hours, hour and a half. The power, okay, the propulsion system, I'm assuming 10 year deceleration rate, which means that you're generating 40 megawatts for 10 years, okay? That's a, that's, uh, the capac that would be 100% of using the um, antimatter on board. Imagine you allowed 1% of that antimatter to be used for course corrections, for moving around within the destination solar system for decades, things like that. So it now it turns out that there's this solid area here at the, on the back edge of this sail. That's, if you lower the voltage a little bit uh, between those two electrodes, you're going to intercept some of the fission daughters, and that's a current, right? Because each of them has a charge of 20, and against, they're going uphill against the voltage, so that's a power supply. So I'm producing onboard power. So if I now uh, say I have 1% of that 40 megawatts, I'm now talking about 400 kilowatts of power, and then 1% of that, I'm talking about sort of tens of kilowatts of power that I could generate along the way. 
So now imagine that I use my communication laser as a LIDAR system. So I send out pulses and I now look for reflected light and I start using that to detect um, Oort cloud objects out far enough in advance within my uh, 0.1 AU radius so that I can kind of bump the ship to do flybys of these various objects as I go. So uh, gone through the numbers and it's reasonable to do uh, basically one object per month. So that means that I'm now sending a lot of data back along the way and you're getting real good physics, you know, astrophysics uh, data back uh, within five years. So now you're not having to wait 100 years or 150 years. You're actually starting to get uh, information back right away. And so the analogy is we're right now getting really good information from Voyager about the heliopause. But no one would have funded Voyager just to do the heliopause measurements. It was because they did the planetary flybys that they were funded. So the question is, is this information about the Oort cloud sufficient to justify the cost of such a mission where you now treat the destination and uh, exoplanet as gravy? Another way which um, is motivated by some, most of the other talks at this meeting is what can I do with uh, chip craft? So now imagine I don't know if you guys are familiar, uh, many of you are old enough to remember Speed Racer, where he had this little drone that came out of his car and he could, uh, the little drone did observations and so on. So the idea would be to use the uh, Breakthrough Starshot chip craft, only now using them at a range of 0.1 AU and setting them, you know, setting out these one, these gram scale chip craft and sending them out, bumping them out with the communication laser again, but now only by 0.1 AU so they could do the flybys. Okay, you use a lot less fuel, a lot less power, and I could actually do weekly flybys now. And so now you're getting 450 rendezvous along the way. We're not even talking about as you leave the Earth or the, our solar system's Oort cloud, you enter the Oort cloud of Proxima or Alpha Centauri. It turns out Proxima Centauri orbits in the Oort cloud of the binary Alpha Centauri. Okay, and so, the, and we have no idea what's going on there. So the amount of astrophysics we're going to be able to do is amazing. Okay, so enough of the fun stuff. Now, uh, antimatter storage. So as I said, what we need to do is store the antimatter as molecular antihydrogen. It's the only realistic way that we've come up with for taking tens of grams of, of antiprotons and being able to store them. And so it turns out that for 50 year, 100 year storage times, uh, the sublimation is a real problem. The propulsion system and the power system uh, doesn't matter whether it's a antiproton or anti-lithium or anti-carbon, if you uh, send that into uh, and overlap that with the uranium nucleus, you still only get one fission. So the only real efficient use of antimatter is anti-protons, which means you're dealing with anti-hydrogen. So we have a propulsion system that needs anti-hydrogen, but we, have, we need a fuel that you can store much longer than anti-hydrogen, so there was a problem. So my wife is a food scientist, and uh, looking over her shoulder over these 30 years of marriage, I learned a lot about this thing called encapsulation. So all these fortified foods you eat, the reason they don't taste weird or don't have weird consistency is because they coat uh, the fortification, uh, you know, the vitamins or whatever else they're putting in the food. They put a coating around it so it doesn't, it dissolves when it's in your stomach, but you don't taste it. And so the, so the proposal here is to do the exact same thing. So you imagine you have an antihydrogen snowball, and I now put an anti-lithium coating around it. So the idea of, of sublimation is that the vapor pressure associated with a material uh, is, is temperature dependent. And if the surrounding vacuum is better than the vapor pressure, you're going to sublimate. Okay, and so what you need to do is you need to have a local environment around the snowflake wherein the vapor, the actual pressure is the same as the vapor pressure. 
The problem is that if the uh, background gas is normal matter, you're going to lose all your anti at all your antimatter due to annihilation uh, to if you're at that vapor pressure. So you really need a container that is made out of antimatter. So that's why this lithium shell makes sense. So the question is, how do you do that? So it turns out, so you go through and you calculate how much anti-lithium do I really need? And the answer is about one part in a thousand. So it's 0.1% of uh, the anti-hydrogen needs to be in the form of anti-lithium. Lithium has a, a very low vapor pressure. You know, here's the vapor pressure for hydrogen. This is temperature. This is vapor pressure. So even at near absolute zero, you have a very high vapor pressure. But for lithium, you, you're actually down at reasonable levels. So the lithium will last over the um, voyage. So basically, uh, what you what you want, well, okay. So uh, to make the um, I'll back up a little bit here. The anti-hydrogen molecules. In one of the criticisms in the past is it's take CERN. You know, it's taken CERN decades to be able to produce a single anti-hydrogen uh, uh, atom. Nobody's even done the molecule. How in the heck would you ever do this at a rate? sufficient for 20 grams per year. And so the, the answer is basically uh, in silicon uh, production where you do um, ion bombardment. So you start out with a kernel of anti-lithium and now you just bombard it with anti beams of anti-protons and positrons. And what will happen is you get a combination of absorption and chemisorption on the surface of the anti-lithium the positrons uh, will migrate on the surface. You actually form anti-hydrogen, uh, molecular anti-hydrogen, and then that will, uh, its sublimation temperature, or this vapor pressure, uh, it will come off that surface. This is actually the mechanism by which most molecular hydrogen, they think, is formed in the galaxy. And it's by uh, antiproton striking dust particles. And so you, you get uh, molecular uh, anti-hydrogen, or hydro molecular hydrogen formed in that, in that case. You can uh, shape your uh, target and you can have, a, so you have a nozzle and you can direct it and I'm not gonna go into this too much. Uh, because we are funding limited and, but we are making progress, we needed an analog to do this experiment. So this summer I had a couple of students working on this. And so what we did instead of, and it's, it turns out that because um, helium is no longer uh, being stored out of oil wells in natural gas wells, uh, it's become very rare. It's almost impossible if you're not a medical center to get liquid helium anymore. And so you need to buy these helium uh, refrigerators and they're, they're like $30,000, way outside of my capacity to buy. So what we did is we went to an analog. So what we're doing is we're coating sulfur, which sublimates at room temperature in a vacuum system, and we're coating it with aluminum. And uh, one of the things that, one of the interesting questions is, when you have a, in, in this case, cold sulfur and a hot aluminum coming in, you will get the formation of aluminum sulfide. The same thing happens when you have uh, a lithium coating being deposited on the surface of a hydrogen snowball. You will get the formation on in, in a in a uh, in a thin layer of uh, lithium hydride formation. And so, how thick that lithium hydride will be is one of the uh, active issues that we would like to address. And so we're doing, we did that, some of that this summer by looking at uh, do you get a aluminum sulfide uh, layer in between the aluminum and the sulfur. So here you see one of our sulfur um, plugs that we created. So how do you make anti-lithium? It's actually fairly straightforward. And it's, so it turns out you take two antiproton beams you collide them and you get anti-deuterons. You split those that into two beams, collide them. You get anti-tritons uh, at 50% efficiency. 
and then you collide. So that's basically DD fusion. And now you do DT fusion and you make your alpha particles, your anti-alpha particles, collide that with the triton and you get lithium-6. And it turns out the mass efficiency of this is 27%, but because you're only, you only need one part in a thousand of this process, your overall production efficiency of antimatter is still 99%. So it really doesn't cost you anything in terms of antimatter or antiproton production to make the anti-lithium. These are all tabletop uh, accelerators. These are all things you can build. I mean, they would all fit in this room easily. So we're not talking about huge facilities. We're not talking about huge power bills. In fact, the power bill for all of this is negligible compared to the power bill to make the antiprotons to begin with. Uh, elect so levitation of, uh, of uh, a anti-lithium coated anti-hydrogen snowball, very similar to technology that's being used today. This is a, uh, a molten drop of metal that's being electrostatically levitated. Uh, the, they use this technique for making new alloys where the alloy, if they did it in a crucible, the alloy would pick up um, impurities from the crucible. And so now in a vacuum, they could put in beams of anything they want and they could create arbitrary alloys with this um, technique. So we're just applying something that's used today and applying that to anti-hydrogen. So the future work plan is, I mean, all along we've been trying to reduce the, the uh, project risk and showing that this is feasible. The main impediment to uh, the idea of antimatter um, propulsion is that there's this perception that it's too expensive, it's too slow, you can't do it. I'm, uh, what I'm hoping to show you is that based on my experience as an accelerator physicist, not as a rocket scientist, not as a planetary scientist, but in, in a, a field that's very specific to this, that this is doable. I mean, it is conceivable to do it this way. Um, you could build, so the, what we're looking at doing is starting from the back end and move, well, starting from the end and moving backward. So what we want to do is make a regular hydrogen snowball, make a, put a regular lithium coating around the regular hydrogen, form a regular lithium with beams of protons and, you know, do the whole thing with regular matter. And then at the end, you just switch polarity. Once I do have antiprotons, switch the polarity, and now all those accelerators that I was using to do the normal matter studies could be used right away to do the antimatter production. Um, if, we had a, if we could bring in $5,000 a month, the rate at which we're making progress would go up by an order of magnitude. about your electrostatic trap. Uh, how stiff does a trap actually have to be in order to withstand the G-forces both on launch and during the acceleration phase? Well, you would, I, I, there's no way that I'm envisioning this, uh, the antimatter being produced on Earth. Well, first of all, the G-forces, I mean, G is so weak compared to electromagnetism that it's irrelevant. When we do accelerator physics, we don't even think I'm about the G forces while you're accelerating through to get to your destination. You're going to be accelerating this thing. The lovely. peak acceleration is 0.5 meters per second squared. So you're not one twentieth of uh, Earth gravity. Okay. It's, it's absolute zero force compared to uh, electromagnetism. I see. Okay. Thank you. Um, Brian. Yeah, I, I love the idea of the uh, electrostatic trap focusing the. Uh, Fission fragments. Um, has that been applied at all to a fission fragment rocket? And is that uh, feasible, you think? I don't, I, I, it took me over a year to figure out that they, because I was at first trying to figure out how would I strip the fission daughters. And then it, I came across this very vague reference uh, that said, oh no, they come off with a charge of 20 anyway. Are you worried that that field will interact with your electrostatic pro anti-proton trap? Since it's in the focus of that electrostatic? No, because the, the, um, the, uh, the uh, number, there's only, on, I mean, there's only a few 
fission daughters within that trap at any one time. So they're negligible in terms of charge. So they're not perturbing the system. Thank you.